This recording will cover Chapter 6 in your textbook, An Introduction to the Viruses. There's no universal agreement on how viruses originated and when they originated. Uh, they're considered to be the most abundant microbes. If we can even consider the microbes on Earth, uh, they are not living. So the definition of microbes is a little iffy here. We know that viruses did play a role in uh, the evolution of bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. They shaped and still continue to shape the genome of these organisms. We call viruses obligate intracellular parasites. This means that they are required to replicate. They don't really have a reproduction system, but uh, they replicate inside of uh, a living organism. They don't have any metabolism. They are much smaller than any living organism, hence the ability to infect any organism. They are not cellular. They have only DNA or RNA, never both. The uh, nucleic acids, as we'll see in this lecture, can either be double-stranded or single-stranded. They multiply by taking control of the host genetic machinery, and then they regulate the synthesis and assembly of new viruses. They lack the enzymes for metabolic processes. In other words, they don't undergo cellular respiration or the Krebs cycle. They steal the uh, necessary components for their replication from the host cell. We can see here some examples of the size of viruses in comparison to some bacteria you're familiar with. You see Streptococcus there that you've seen in laboratory, and it's about one micrometer in diameter. E. coli is about twice as long as Streptococcus. Then the smallest known bacteria, um, especially in the medical community that we're concerned with, are the Rickettsia, and they're about three-tenths of a micrometer. Then taking a look from the left over to the right, you see the largest virus that infects humans, which is the pox virus. And the pox virus actually is visible as a tiny dot under the microscope at a thousand x magnification. Uh, you would not know it's a virus if you when you were looking at it. Herpes simplex, you can see number two, quite large, going all the way down to um, uh, the smallest yellow fever virus, which is a virus that's related to Zika, and that's number nine. You can see as you look at these viruses as well that they have some different configurations. Uh, you see some of them have spikes on them. You see some of them have envelopes. So uh, viruses have evolved a variety of different um, structures that allow them to infect human cells and any other cell on the planet <laughs> for that uh, matter. And in the background, you can see the yeast cell. So the yeast cell is eukaryotic, and you can see that it's much, much larger than either, the, uh, bacteria, either of the bacterial cells. Viruses uh, lack any protein synthesizing machinery. Again, uh, they don't have ribosomes, so they are incapable of making their own proteins necessary to replicate themselves. Uh, they only contain the parts necessary to invade and control a host cell, so they are very, very efficient. Uh, the virus particle is going to have some type of a covering around it. It's typically a protein. Uh, that protein is called a capsid. And then some viruses have a, an envelope that is coating the capsid. The envelope actually is stolen from the host cell. The virus does not synthesize the envelope. Uh, it does personalize it, however. The central core is going to be the nucleic acid. And then there are sometimes uh, matrix proteins or enzymes that are found inside with the central core. All viruses are going to have some protection on the outside. That is a capsid. And this is a protein that encodes, uh, encloses and protects the nucleic acid. The capsid, along with the nucleic, is nucleic acid, is referred to as the nucleocapsid. Some viruses have an external covering. This is the envelope, and the envelope, as I mentioned before, is stolen from the host cell. And those that are lacking an envelope are naked. Those that have envelopes and those that are naked are going to get out of the host cell in different fashions. Each capsid is made of identical protein subunits that are called capsomers. The synthesis of these capsomers is going to be under the direction of the nucleic acid of the virus. So the virus's nucleic acid will direct the host cell to make these capsomers, and then these capsomers self-assemble. There are two structural capsid types. One is a helical type. This is sort of like one of those bracelets you've seen, uh, um, elongated beads on an elastic. And this is a continuous helix of capsomers. This forms a cylindrical nucleocapsid. So in the purple, you see the nucleic acid. 
the blue, you see the nu nucleocapsid. So the capsid forms a helix around the nucleic acid. Icosahedral is more like a rack of pool balls. So you can see the capsomers. And the capsomers are going to be arranged, uh, and they are specific to the type of virus. They are icosahedral, 20-sided, with 12 corners. So as you can see in uh, image B, you see the uh, icosahedral structure. It's sort of like one of those dice that um, my son, when he was younger, played a game called Magic, and it had a 20-sided die. That was an icosahedral die, and each one of those faces is going to uh, have the capsomers in there. So each facet has a specific number of capsomers, and the capsomer number is going to be specific to that virus. Sometimes there's going to be vertices. Well, there always will be vertices, but sometimes there will be fibers that are sticking out of the vertices. The envelope uh, is going to be stolen from the host cell, and this is mostly found in animal viruses. If you think about it, it plant viruses would be unlikely because the it, plants have a cell wall. So taking an envelope from a virus that uh, has a cell wall covering it would be quite difficult. Animal cells don't have a cell wall, so it's, it's easier for the virus to steal the envelope. Uh, the envelope is not only the host cell membrane. It can also come from the endoplasmic reticulum, as we'll learn in Module 5. Uh, viruses that get out of the host cell that have an envelope are going to take it when they leave. So they're going to, uh, rather than bursting out of the host cell, they're actually going to extrude. So they will bud off of the host cell membrane and take the membrane with it. Sometimes they're exposed proteins on the outside of the envelope, and these are called spikes. The spikes are actually going to be synthesized by the virus, and then they're going to be positioned in the host cell membrane. This is where the virus is going to bud out. Spikes are, as we learned earlier, are essential for attachment of the virus to the host cell. The caps in an envelope have important functions for the virus. So first, they are going to protect the nucleic acid when the virus is outside of the host cell. Viruses are considered to be inert when they are outside of the host cell. The uh, capsid or the envelope is going to help the virus bind, bind to the cell surface, and it is also going to assist with the penetration of viral DNA or RNA into the suitable host cell. And suitable is an important word here because the viruses are very specific for the host cell that they can attach to. For example, influenza uh, has no receptors that can attach to the skin, but has receptors that can attach to mucous membranes. Viruses have some very interesting structures. The, uh, the atypical viruses are called complex. Some examples here are the pox viruses and bacteriophages. Pox viruses don't have a typical capsid. In fact, if you look at them with an electron microscope, they often look like a closed pine cone. They're covered by a dense, a dense layer of lipoproteins, which is very different from any type of other virus. Uh, the pox viruses that you might be familiar with are um, smallpox. Uh, smallpox has been eradicated. A relative of smallpox is cowpox. Uh, chickenpox virus does not fit into this category. Chickenpox virus is actually a herpes virus. Bacteriophages are the viruses that infect bacteria. The word phage or phage means to eat. And these viruses are going to destroy bacteria. They have a polyhedral nucleocapsid along with a helical tail and attachment fibers. So if you direct your attention here to image C, you can see the capsid. The capsid is, has the nucleic, in, nucleic acid inside. There is a collar, then below that is a sheath. The sheath is much like a spring, so it actually can retract and contract. Uh, below that you see the tail fibers. The tail fibers are structures that are going to attach to the host cell, so at the end of the tail fibers there will be receptors for the bacterial cell. The virus then will squat down on the bacterium and attach by the tail pins. So here you can see some examples of viruses. Number one is a complex virus. This happens to be a pox virus and it's the uh, flexible tailed bacteriophage. Bacteriophage are going to be classified according to the uh, bacteria that they can infect. For example, a coliphage will infect E. coli. <clears throat> Let me see some envelope viruses. 
Uh, number three is the mumps virus. Number four is the rhabdo virus. Number, rhabdo um, is a bullet-shaped virus, and that one causes rabies. They have a helical nucleocapsid. Then an icosahedral nucleocapsid, we see number five is the herpes virus. We can see that the herpes virus has uh, an envelope surrounding it that it steals from the host cell membrane. And number six is the HIV virus. HIV um, it also has a uh, icosahedral nucleocapsid. And then we see some non-envelope viruses down in the left corner. The helical virus number seven, for example, is a virus that infects plants. This is called a, the plum pox virus. And then we see a polio virus number eight and the uh, human papillomavirus number nine. So you can see that they are icosahedral in shape and uh, they have no envelope. The nucleic acid found inside of the virus is going to be very minimal. It's just going to be enough to direct the virus to make whatever it needs to get into, replicate, and then get out of the cell. It carries the genes necessary to invade, and it directs the host cell's activity. So the host cell becomes essentially helpless when the virus is in there. Uh, it's uh, an ultimate terrorist who takes over inside of the virus. The number of genes that we find for each type of virus is going to vary from few to hundreds. DNA viruses usually have double-stranded DNA, but they also can be single-stranded DNA. The DNA can be circular or it can be linear. RNA viruses are usually single-stranded. They may be double-stranded, but if they're double-stranded, they may be segmented into separate RNA pieces. The single-stranded RNA genomes are ready for immediate translation, so we call them positive sense RNA. This means they act as messenger RNA directly, so when the genome is stripped of its uh, outer coating, then that genome can actually act as messenger RNA, directing the ribosome to make proteins immediately. The genomes that have to be converted are called negative sense RNA. The conversion is going to be done via an enzyme, so negative sense RNA is going to be converted into positive sense RNA. The virus may bring that enzyme with it, or the virus may direct the cell to synthesize that enzyme in order to convert the negative sense RNA into positive sense RNA. Some viruses carry with them, like baggage, uh, a preformed, preformed enzymes. Polymerases, for example, are going to make copies of the DNA or the RNA for replication. Replicases are enzymes that are going to copy RNA and then reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that converts RNA into DNA. So retroviruses, including the AIDS virus, do this. Retro means reverse. So retroviruses are RNA viruses, but they direct the activity of the virus into DNA, and then the DNA is going to incorporate into the host cell genome. Uh, as you did your assignment for your, uh, your little vacation, Viruses you see are classified very differently than bacteria are, uh, as well as other living organisms. So the major criteria are going to be structure, chemical composition, and genetic makeup. Because they don't sexually reproduce and because they're not even living, it's much more difficult to have a classification based on um, phonetics. Phrenetics, excuse me. Uh, currently, we recognize three orders, 63 families, and 263 genera of viruses. Typically, we just name them with a family name. The family name ends in viridae, which is the herpes viridae example here. The genus name ends in virus. So, if, for example, if we're talking about herpes virus, we would call it the herpes simplex virus or the, or the simplex virus. And then we have a common name to describe viruses, including something like herpes simplex virus 1, and then it's even shortened to HSV-1. So you've heard of HPV. That's a uh, human papillomavirus, and that would be, uh, the papillomavirus would be its genus name. Okay. So you can see the classifications of some viruses on here. I'm not going to belabor this fact, uh, but you can see the name of the disease, the name of the, uh, the common name of the virus, very, very commonly, uh, the name of the virus, the common name is going to be the same name as the disease, for example, hepatitis A. Uh, and then we have families. So you see the family name ends with viridae, 
Then we've got genus. The genus is going to end with the word vi virus. Uh, you can see that this is going to be uh, italicized. So genus is going to be italicized again. There's not going to be any species names here. Common names are most commonly how they're referred to uh, when they are reported in scientific literature. Here again, you can see some other families. So when we get into module five, we're going to be looking at every one of these families and looking at the specific diseases. So everything you see on the right, uh, we are going to, far right, we are going to be covering, uh, or nearly everything we'll be covering in module five. So viral multiplication uh, has a very specific cycle, and it begins with adsorption. This is not absorption, but adsorption. The virus is going to bind to specific molecules on the host cell, and then the virus is either going to penetrate, the entire uh, virus is going to penetrate where the uh, capsid enters, or sometimes the uh, only the genome enters the cell. So some viruses are going to take off their coat before they come in the door. Other viruses are going to come in the door and not take off their coat until they get inside. Uncoating is when the nucleic acid is released from the capsid. And synthesis, the fourth step, is when the virus is going to direct the host cell to make new components. Assembly is when the viral particles are constructed. Scientists are learning a lot more now about, about how viruses assemble once they're inside of the cell. Uh, this is important to understand because this may be a way that we can stop viral infections and stop the virus from assembling. So some of the drugs, as we'll be learning later this semester, prevent viruses from absor absorbing or penetrating. Other drugs prevent uncoating. And now some of the newer drugs are going to prevent assembly. Finally, once the new virus is completely assembled, it's going to be released. There are a variety of ways viruses are released. They can either uh, get out by budding. Those are going to be those that carry with them an envelope. Or they're going to explode the cell, which is cell lysis. Either way, either way there is a great deal of damage done to the host cell. Uh, so typically what happens is the in the human system, our immune system is going to uh, attack these viruses and is going to stop the infection. So here we can see an image. Uh, in step number one, we see the virus. This is an envelope virus, as it happens to be. Uh, it has spikes on it. The spikes are going to recognize receptors on the cell membrane. Uh, we see the virus engulfed into a vesicle. Very often the uh, cell is, is told to do this. So it is told to, um, sort of like a vampire, invite invite the uh, virus into the cell. The virus then uncoats in step number three. The RNA is going to be released under the control of viral genes. The cell synthesizes uh, the basic components necessary. So the, as you can, it's not shown here, but the ribosomes are going to be necessary to make new um, proteins for the virus. And enzymes such as replicases are going to make copies of the RNA. All of this is then going to come together in step five, which is assembly. And the virus is going to release, in this case, because it is an envelope, it's going to bud off the cell membrane, carrying away the envelope with spikes. Okay. <clears throat> so the way the virus is going to attach to the host cell is, is completely coincidental. Uh, it's going to collide with a susceptible host cell, adsorb to receptor sites, and the spectrum of a virus, a spectrum of cells of virus can infect is, in fact, is called the host range. So it's very specific. The host range uh, is the spectrum of cells a virus can infect. For example, for hepatitis B, the host range is only human liver cells. Poliovirus, however, has a more, a more broad host range. It ex, uh, is going to infect primate intestinal cells and also nerve cells. And then rabies has the capability of infecting various cells of many different mammals. So rabies is going to have a much broader host range than hepatitis B. There are two mechanisms by which enveloped viruses enter host cells. In one of the mechanisms, the virion attacks cell receptors by specific proteins on its surface called spikes. The envelope of the virus fuses with the plasma membrane of the host, and the nucleocapsid is released directly into the cytoplasm. The nucleic acid then separates from the protein coat. 
In the second mechanism, the enveloped virus adsorbs to the host cell by specific proteins on its surface, and the virion is taken in by endocytosis. In this process, the host cell plasma membrane surrounds the whole virion and forms a vesicle. The envelope of the virion then fuses with the plasma membrane of the vesicle, and the nucleocapsid is released into the host cytoplasm. The capsid protein is then removed, releasing the nucleic acid of the virus. A naked virion also enters by endocytosis. Since the virus has no envelope, it cannot fuse with the plasma membrane. After being engulfed, the viral nucleic acid is released from the endocytic vesicle. The nucleic acid then separates from the capsid. So as you saw in the video, uh, the cell membrane is going to be penetrated by the virus or its nucleic acid, and one mechanism is endocytosis, where the entire virus is engulfed, or fusion, when the envelope merges directly with the membrane. So this results in the nucleocapsid's entry into the cytoplasm. Remember, the cell membrane is going to be of the same structure as the viral membrane, essentially. It's going to be a, a phospholipid bilayer because that membrane was stolen from another host cell. So when you get the flu from somebody else, you can uh, thank them because they're giving you some of their uh, host cell membrane. So here you can see, as, as you, uh, was in the, the video, <clears throat> there's going to be an attachment of the virion to uh, specific receptors. In the first one, you can see that there is a, a fusion of the membrane proteins and the nucleocapsid enters into the cell. In the second one, again, you see uh, <clears throat> engulfment. Engulfment, in this case, we see the membrane actually uh, being endo, I'm sorry, we see the virus being endocytosed into the host cell membrane. The envelope and the vesicle break down, the capsid breaks down, and this frees the DNA. And then finally, in the third one, you can see receptors again. The virus adheres to the host receptors. It's engulfed into the vesicle. And in this case, it's RNA. It's going to be released from the vesicle. <clears throat> Replication of the virus and creating proteins is going to depend on whether the virus is DNA or RNA. DNA viruses are going to be replicated and assembled in the nucleus. That makes sense because that's where we find DNA in the host cell. RNA viruses are going to be replicated and assembled in the cytoplasm, which also makes sense because that's where RNA does, it th does its thing. Positive sense RNA contains the message for translation, whereas negative sense RNA must be converted into positive sense RNA and to act as messenger RNA. Assembled viruses then leave the host cell in one of two ways, budding. They are going to um, take the host cell membrane with them. The nucleocapsid binds to the membrane. It pinches off and then sheds the virus gradually. The cell is not immediately destroyed. This happens with HIV, for example, which you see on the top right image uh, B. HIV gradually destroys the cell. Uh, in lysis, non-enveloped and complex viruses release when the cell dies, and the, the cell death is going to be uh, programmed by the virus. The virus is going to cause the cell to lyse, it ruptures, and the uh, virus is going to be released. Enveloped viruses are usually released from the host cell by a budding mechanism. First, viral spike proteins are inserted into the host cell membrane. Next, the inside of the host cell membrane becomes coated with viral matrix protein. The viral capsid then becomes completely enclosed by the region of the cell membrane into which the spikes and matrix protein are embedded and the virus is released by budding. We can tell that there is damage to the host cell by looking at the host cell with a microscope. We call these cytopathic effects. And this is one way to diagnose how the cell, how what in, virus is actually infecting a host cell. <clears throat> now remember, viruses are very specific for the cells that they will affect. Uh, so that in order to study them, we have to know what virus we are looking for and then choose the appropriate cell culture. Cytopathic effects include changes in the size and the shape of the cell. Sometimes we see inclusion bodies inside of the, inside of the cytoplasm. We can see inclusion bodies inside of the nucleus. 
We also can see fusion of cells to form multinucleated cells. This happens with respiratory syncytial virus. Respiratory syncytial virus um, forms syncytia, and syncytia are um, aggregations of cells. In Module 5, we'll learn about a respiratory syncytial virus. Cytopathic effects also include cell lysis, so we look at cells uh, one day and the next day they've all exploded. We can also see changes to the DNA, and then we also can see that the host cell is transformed. In transformation, uh, a normal cell turns into a cell that is cancerous, that continues to replicate without any control. So uh, scientists that is studying viruses will see certain cytopathic changes. Uh, for, for example, I remember studying herpes simplex virus when I was in graduate school, and we would see these uh, syncytia, you can see the spelling of that word here, S-Y-N-C-Y-T-I-A. So herpes simplex causes the cells to form uh, syncytia in culture. Polio virus just explodes the cell. I studied a relative of the polio virus when I was in graduate school. We would inoculate the cells on uh, Monday. Tuesday, when we came back to look at it, all the cells would be floating in culture. They would all be dead because the polio virus had uh, taken command of them, made new polio virus. Uh, it was actually called the M virus that I was studying. It wasn't polio. And uh, they would explode the cells. Uh, rabies virus doesn't cause any change in the cell shape, but it does cause inclusions in the cytoplasm of uh, neurological cells, and these are called negri bodies. Measles virus also causes a syncytia. Persistent infections are uh, in infections where the cells harbor the virus and is not immediately lysed. So this is, would be common with a virus that is budding out of the cell. Persistent infections can last weeks. Sometimes they can last a host, a host lifetime, and some can periodically reactivate. Uh, we call this a chronic latent state. The three here, that examples that are given that can reactivate are measles virus, herpes simplex, and herpes zoster. The word herpes means to creep. Measles virus may remain uh, hidden in the brain for many, many years, and then later it leads to something called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, and this can lead to death. So measles virus, people think, well, it's no big deal. I'm not going to vaccinate my kids against it. If you are infected with the measles virus later in your life, you may develop and die from SSPE. Herpes simplex virus we know uh, periodically reactivates. It causes cold sores. Genital herpes um, also periodically reactivates, and in Module 5 we'll learn more about this. Herpes zoster virus causes chickenpox, and you know that it's the same virus that causes shingles. Uh, the chickenpox virus, herpes zoster, is going to reactivate later in life, causing shingles. Some animal viruses are going to enter the host cell and permanently alter its genetic material, so it causes cancer. Uh, some of those we'll see in Module 5, including a B-cell lymphoma uh, that is caused by <clears throat> a virus. Transformed cells have an increased rate of growth, alterations in chromosomes, the capacity to divide for indefinite periods of time, resulting in tumors. And these are all definitions of a cancerous cell. Mammalian viruses capable of causing tumors are called oncovirus. An oncologist is a, a doctor who uh, treats cancer, so onco means cancer. These are called oncoviruses. Two examples here are the papillomavirus. Human papillomavirus is known to cause cervical cancer, and there is a very successful vaccine that's been given recently for HPV called Gardasil. And uh, Epstein Barr virus is the virus that. Um, causes Burkitt's lymphoma. Ep Epstein-Barr virus causes mononucleosis. In certain conditions, it causes Burkitt's lymphoma, seen more in Africa, and there appears to be some type of co-infection with uh, the malaria parasite. Now, bacteriophages are, are, are viruses that infect bacteria. So it's, sometimes we just call them phages or phages. The most widely studied are those that infect E. coli, so they're called colophages. They have a complex structure, as you saw earlier, with this uh, strange-looking tail fibers, and they are DNA viruses. The multiplication uh, cycle is going to be very similar. In this case, only the nucleic acid enters the cytoplasm, so there is no uncoating necessary. Uh, remember that the bacterium does have a cell wall, 
So these are going to have uh, no envelope around them. And the release is going to be as a result of cell lysis because the, the uh, virus is not going to be taking any of the membrane with it. Uh, the viruses accumulate inside of the cell and they explode. This is called the lytic cycle. As you can see, very similar to what goes on with an animal virus, the virus adsorbs, it penetrates, but in this case, only the genome enters the host cell, it replicates, so it steals everything necessary, including the ribosomes and the enzymes. It assembles, uh, which is it's pretty amazing how complicated these viruses are, yet they only have about 50, 50 uh, proteins in them. They mature, and then they release via lysis. So here you can see two uh, cycles, the lytic cycle, that means to lyse the cell. The lysogenic state is when the virus actually becomes incorporated into the host cell genome. So you can see the single circular chromosome inside of the bacterial cell. And here we see the virus that has incorporated into the genome. Hence the name lysogenic, to lyse the gene. So it's stuck inside of the genome. Every time the, the bacterium then replicates, and you know how fast E. coli replicates, it actually replicates the virus along with it. Now, going from the lytic cycle to the lysogenic cycle, uh, can go back and forth with this. The lytic cycle actually is when the virus is going to replicate inside of the host cell. Oops, we're going in this direction. It replicates inside of the host cell. The new viral particles are going to assemble, and you can see the complicated pieces that have to come together. When the virus comes together, we call this maturation, and then the host cell is weakened and the virus can replicate. So this is the lytic cycle. This is the lysogenic cycle. The virus, when it is in the lysogenic state, is going to be latent, and we call this the prophage. So inside of the genome, this is the prophage. So the differences here are uh, covered in the table. The uh, adsorption, the similarities, of course, are going to be precise attachments, but how they are going to attach depends upon what the virus has. The virus is going to be, with a bacteriophage, is going to be injected in there. So with animal viruses, the whole virus gets engulfed, whereas with the bacteriophage, the nucleic acid gets injected. Synthesis and uh, assembly, of course, is only going to happen with the bacteria in the cytoplasm because there is no nucleus, so there cannot be any nuclear replication. Uh, viral persistency in bacteriophage, if the virus does become part of the nucleic acid, we call this lysogeny. With uh, human viruses, for example, we see chronic infection, cancer, or latency. Lysis uh, is going to be the only way bacteriophage get out. Some with animal viruses, we see lysis or we can see budding. Cell destruction with bacteriophage is going to be immediate. With, uh, with animal viruses can be immediate or can be delayed. And I love this picture here. This is a bacterial cell. You can see all these viruses here that are attached to it. This, this cell is completely doomed. Okay. So in lysogeny, as I mentioned before, uh, the viral DNA is going to enter into the uh, host cell chromosome. And the host, remember, we're talking about here are bacteria. Uh, some DNA bacterial viruses that are called temperate phages undergo adsorption and penetration, but they don't replicate. The genome ins uh, inserts into the genome, I'm sorry, the viral genome inserts into the bacterial genome, and it becomes what is called a prophage. At this point, it's replicated and copied during normal cell division, and that results in the transfer of the temperate phage genome to all host cell progeny, and the state is called lysogeny, or the lysogenic cycle. When the lysogenic cycle converts into the lytic cycle, we call this induction. Induction uh, recurs in the, uh, occurs in activation of the lysogenic prophage, followed by viral replication and cell lysis. Okay. So the same uh, image that we just saw with the lysogenic state and the lytic state. Okay. Lysogeny results in the spread of the virus without killing the host cell, a very efficient mechanism. 
Uh, the FOS genes in bacterial chromosome can cause the production of toxins or enzymes. And this is interesting to us from a clinical standpoint. For example, if the uh, bacterium, Carinibacterium diphtheriae, as you can see by the name, causes diphtheria, if the virus is infecting and causing a, a, a lysogenic state, so as it is inside of the bacterial cell inside of the genome, it causes the organism to produce the AB toxins that we learned about earlier that cause the signs and symptoms of diphtheria. Vibrio cholerae is the same way. It is a prophage that produces cholera toxin, CT, and Clostridium botulinum produces a toxin it, which is under the direction of the virus that is incorporated into its genome, not its genome itself. When phage lambda infects E. coli, either the lytic or the lysogenic cycle may be followed. In both cases, the first step involves the phage attaching to the host cell and injecting its DNA into the host cell. In the lytic cycle, phage nucleic acid is replicated and phage genes are expressed, resulting in production of phage proteins. Mature phage particles assemble and the host cell lysis, releasing the phage particles. In the lysogenic cycle, the phage DNA is not replicated or transcribed. Instead, the phage DNA integrates into the host cell genome. The host cell can then replicate, carrying the integrated phage genome. The integrated DNA is referred to as prophage DNA, and the host cells carrying the prophage DNA are said to be in the lysogenic state. When the cells are exposed to ultraviolet light or to certain chemicals, phage induction occurs. The prophage DNA is excised and the phage enters the lytic cycle. You see this uh, is entitled the lambda phage. Lambda phage are typical viruses that infect E. coli. So identification of viruses is difficult. It's easier now uh, to, because we're no longer trying to cultivate them in order to identify those that are causing infection, we're looking for some trace of them. And the trace typically is going to be antibodies that humans uh, produce in response to being infected. So they need the appropriate cell to replicate. In order to find out if a person is infected with a herpes virus, we have to know that we are looking for a herpes virus and use specific cells or tissue cultures. So viruses can be grown in the laboratory, not on artificial media. There are no augers that will grow viruses, but instead we need tissue culture. And tissue culture is when we have cultured cells growing in sheets that support the replication of viruses. And then we can look for those cytopathic effects that we saw on a previous slide. We can also use bird embryos, uh, incubating eggs, for example, or ideal systems. We can inject the virus through the cell. Viruses that are raised for the influenza vaccine, for example, are cultivated on bird embryos. And then sometimes it is necessary to use live animals uh, to, or to see the effects of a virus. When I was in graduate school, we used a certain type of mouse, and the mouse would be uh, susceptible to the viral infection, and we could observe the effects on the mouse. So here you can see a uh, tissue culture. These are perfectly healthy cells here. You can see they're nice and rounded. They have nice nuclei in them. And here you see after the in infection of the virus, we see uh, large areas of dead cells here. The virus has replicated. In um, A here, you can see this is a, an introduction, <coughs> excuse me, of the virus into the eggs of uh, the chicken egg. And here you can see there are certain areas so uh, the chorioantoic membrane, the yolk sac, the amniotic cavity, the embryo itself, these are all areas where the virus can be inoculated and there will be specific receptors. So depending upon what you want to grow, you have to know which cells are going to ex uh, accept the virus. And then on C, what you see here are called plaques. So these dark spots that you see here are actually cells, uh, areas of cells that have died due to the presence of the virus. Once the uh, cell culture is on this uh, single layer here, we call this a monolayer, 
the viruses are, I'm sorry, the cells are growing all over the surface here. And then the virus is introduced. There's going to be a liquid over the surface here. Everything will be incubated. And then the next day, the liquid is going to be removed. It's going to be full of viruses, of course. The um, cells are going to be stained with what's called a super vital stain. The stain will only stain living cells. So all of these um, clear spots that you see here, they almost look blue. Those actually are dead cells, and we call those plaques, just like spelled the same as the plaque on your teeth. Viruses, of course, uh, for humans are the cause of acute infections. There are several billion virus infections per year, and several of them have high mortality rates. Uh, there's a possible connection of viruses to chronic afflictions of unknown cause. For example, it's thought that multiple sclerosis may be due to a herpes virus. Um, viruses are the major participants, of, of course, in the Earth's ecosystem. Uh, as you can see, viruses are going to kill bacteria. So viruses infecting bacteria are going to uh, change and are going to influence the ecosystem of the planet. It's much more difficult to identify and treat uh, viral infections. Very often the physician is just looking for some type of clue that it's a viral infection. I mentioned before um, whether or not there's a fever, whether or not uh, the white blood cell picture changes. More likely there will be neutrophils if it's a bacterial infection. There's going to be an increase in lymphocytes if it's a viral, excuse me, a viral infection. So the physician takes an overall clinical picture and then can take an appropriate sample. Cell cultures typically are not done for diagnosis. They're far too expensive. They take too long. Screening for parts of the virus is much more common, so we can look for viral DNA signatures. Uh, for example, a sample can be taken, and then uh, this happens often with herpes simplex virus. We can look for certain uh, DNA segments, genes that are found only in herpes viruses. And then most often, uh, still today, we look for immune response. If there are antibodies uh, present against a virus, we can see if the antibody count, antibody uh, load is going to increase over a period of time. If it increases from week one to week three, we know there's an active, and viral, active viral infection. Or if it decreases, if there's a high antibody uh, level to a certain virus and it decreases over a three-week period, we knew the person was infected with the virus. So it's a rather indirect way of looking for it, uh, but with without easier techniques, that really is uh, the only way, effective way right now. Antiviral drugs we'll look at in the next module. Uh, antiviral drugs and up until very recently, have not been able to cure individuals from a viral infection. They're just sort of able to keep viral infections at, at bay. This is the very first time I've been able to say in 26 years of teaching that we actually have a cure for one viral infection, and that happens to be hepatitis C. The drug called Harvoni is actually effective at curing, just like an antibiotic would cure a bacterial infection, Harvoni is capable, not in all situations, but is capable of curing a hepatitis C infection. This is the very first drug that has ever been able to do this. Antiviral drugs usually just hold the viral infection at bay until the host cell's immune response can clear it. So if you get a cold, if you get influenza, you can count on your immune system, hopefully if it's empty, to cure you of the infection. Prions, which is the last thing we're going to look at here, these are misfolded proteins. They do not contain nucleic acid, yet they are capable of replicating. So these are replicating proteins, something very odd. They're very resistant to usual sterilization techniques. They can uh, survive autoclaving. They can survive chemical disinfection. And they cause something called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. So uh, they are spongiform because they cause sponge-like sponge looking uh, lesions in the brain, hence the name encephalopathies, and these are fatal neurodegenerative diseases. Some of them, which we'll look at in more detail in Module 5, include scrapie, which is called, caused, uh, caused by a prion disease in sheep and goats, bovine spongiform encephalopathies, uh, mad cow disease are caused by a prion, Wasting disease, which is seen in the United States in elk. Uh, I understand it is primarily in the central portion of the United States, in the northern, north, north central Montana area. 
And in humans, there is a disease called Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome. It actually, this prion can go through several layers of uh, gloves. So physicians are uh, more likely to be infected with this and it can be transmitted through brain surgery. So in module five, we'll take a look at some of these prion diseases.